Good morning. Let's pray. Father, our time this morning is all about you. Help us to set our eyes on you. Help us to delight in you. Help us to delight to please you. Help us to be brothers like that song describes, caring for one another because you have cared for us so sweetly. May our time in the Word today be enriching, be encouraging, be a blessing to you, blessing to this flock. Thank you for them. Thank you for each one that's here this morning. Thank you for their faithfulness to stick it out in the weekend, those that have been with us all weekend, those that come here regularly. Help us to see Jesus and to magnify him. In his name we ask it, amen. I want to start just by saying thank you. We have enjoyed our time with you. I know we're going to have a time tonight, but some are probably not going to be able to be with us tonight. And uh, we have felt such sweet and gracious care in the whole time, such attentiveness to all of uh, our possible needs and way beyond that to many of our desires. And we have delighted that. I would like to take an additional moment to thank you for what you did over 10 years ago. Dave and Carol built a friendship with our son, our oldest son, built a friendship with all of us. Ten years ago, he came to you and spent four years with you in the seminary. And I will tell you, we felt loved by the way you loved our son. We felt cared for. We felt that he was in a safe place because of the way you cared for him. We came for his graduation six years ago. It had such fond memories. I remember coming on campus and everyone was very gracious to us and says, oh, because we had been here once before for a mission trip and remembered us a little bit, but they also said, you're Phil's folks, right? I said, yeah, so good to see you, so good to have you here. And then some of them sort of got that look in their eye and said, so what brings you here? Oh, we know. You're here for graduation. You're here to take Phil away from us. I will tell you, a couple of you said that with tears in your eyes. I want to tell you that softened a dad's heart. The fact that you had loved him that well, the fact that he has won his way into your heart was beyond delightful to us. It was a blessing to know he was here. It was a blessing to know he was getting great training. It's a blessing to know that he was loved so well. And um, you left a great impact on his heart. And I will tell you, that's probably the biggest reason why we're here today. He had such a great experience with you and your care and your focus on Christ and ministry that we're excited about being here. We're excited about ministering with you, not just to you, but with you. This is all of us together in the Lord's vineyard trying to seek His glory. I want you to hear clearly that we are delighted with the way you've cared for us and the way you've cared for us and our son. It is a delight to be back with you this time this weekend and to have great time in the Word, great fellowship. This morning we want to wrap up our series. We're actually wrapping up tonight in a sense, but wrapping up the series as far as the teaching time. Tonight is application. We intend to go back to the case study we started on Friday night and start to turn through some of that, answering some of those questions. By now, the expectation is you're able to answer every one of those questions. You are counselors, right? You have all the right answers. You're ready to help that person out. So we're going to put somebody up on stage and you all become... No, we're not going to do that. We are going to talk about that. We hope to touch on a couple of other things just to close the loop. Make sure we've finished up with that. But also then the goal would be to give you a time question and answer. We've had some times like that in various sessions, but a little bit more, and then to spend some time just doing the application. So where do we go from here? It's always an important question. One of my fears, I will just say that in almost every teaching opportunity, is the temptation to give you lots of stuff, dump a load, and you walk away saying, great stuff, put it in a binder, put it on a shelf, and it collects dust. The call of God is not to know information. The call of God is to do what you know, to apply what you've been given. I have not served you well if I leave you with greater information and yet don't leave the church more equipped, more energized, more excited and motivated 
to do what God's called you to do and to leave you with everything in your hands to be able to do it instantly. Tonight, my hope is that you go forward from that service where we're done at 6.30 and you're anxiously talking to your spouse on the way home or your friend on the way home. I hope somebody calls and asks me a counseling question. I am ready. I hope somebody wants to get with me this week. I want to counsel. I want you to be primed. I want you to be ready. I want you to be excited about it. This morning's sermon is the capstone of everything we've talked about. You may be familiar with some of the things, I don't know that much about it, but I know as they build archways out of rock, fascinating things in the old architecture, they will start in an archway and they'll start up one side and they'll lay the foundation stone, put it down and they gradually build on it, piece after piece, and gradually it starts building that angle, the archway, and then they do the other side and build that side up and build that archway up and get it up. They have to hold it all up for a while because the pressure, the gravity pressure pushing it would cause it to fall in. But the plan is that they put this stone at the very top, sort of beveled like this, same height as the rocks, and they drop that in and it's matched perfectly to the gap that's there between the two sides in this archway. That capstone ties it all together. It's perfectly measured to be exact dimensions to where those things don't flex it all in. They just barely touch each other. And the weight of that gravity together holds it all together. My hope this morning is to do that in our sermon, to tie it all together. You will hear a number of truths that we've talked about before throughout the week. Truths that Doug and Joel talked to you about and various things. We're trying to tie all this together, to bring it together, and to help you to say, now I get it, the whole package. We want you to take all the puzzle pieces you've received through our weekend, put them in, and have the beautiful picture of, ah... This is what God wants me to do. I want to challenge you with our text. That it's meant to do that. Dave has already read our text. Wonderful, wonderful text. Let me start by illustrating where we're going. Three years ago, about three years ago, a little over that, we decided we wanted to move out of the city where we're at there in Illinois. Dave described it in the middle of this country. We wanted to move to the country, we wanted to move to a little more rural setting for us. It's less developed, there's woods, there's agriculture, there's farming, there's livestock. Not as developed in many ways. This is about, it put us out of town about 15 minutes or so. We were delighted for that. We shopped for a while trying to find just the right property and we were delighted to be there. One of the things we learned, though, is the transition from city living to country living involves some additional dangers. Drive on country roads that weren't developed and you had bush growing up around you, trees and agricultural crops and that, it, there was a lot of wildlife there that could be a threat. We have deer in the U.S. It's similar to like your spring buck, but the size may be more of your cattle. Maybe cattle is the best way of illustrating here your cows on the side of the road. Just running wild. Deer is not domesticated. It's just wild. It's open. And it just does what it wants. And many times you think it's the silliest animal on the earth. But living out in the country, the deer have no bounds. They're in charge of it all. It's like cattle. It's just roaming wherever it wants. There are certain times of the day, certain times of the night, certain seasons where they're more active. One of the things we learned within the first year is we need to be more cautious about the movement of the deer. Within almost the first year, we had run into deer four times. And if you can imagine the size of a cow, we're running 100, 120 kilometers per hour, it did significant damage to the vehicles. Never injured us. Almost every one of them we were able to drive home, but almost every one of them we had to take to the shop to have significant body work, some engine work. After four times, you'd think after one time we'd get it, okay? But it took us four, and we said, we need to do something different. And we started thinking about different routes, maybe that had less bush along the side, less uh, vegetation. We decided to maybe change up some of the process, some of the speed, be more aware. We knew where they were at normally. There were some feeding grounds where they were crossing the roads. So he became more sensitive to that. One of the things we also did in that process is as people came to visit us, particularly our kids, we'd give them 
very clear warnings. Be careful, the deer are out tonight. Remember, it's dusk, it's, you know, sun's going down, it's a time where they're moving, they're onto the feeding grounds, or in the morning, or there's certain roads we would point out to them, do this or don't do that, don't go that road, take this road. It made us very sensitive to warn others of that danger. Might I say it this way, we wanted to stir them up to be careful, to be alert, to watch out, to give special attention to your driving, not like in the city where you just stay in your line and do your stuff. You need to pay attention more so. You may need to turn off the radio. You may need to focus in because you need to be watching. And for us, we're starting to get weary. You watch for little eyes. And dead at night, your lights will shine and you can pick that up. You see reflectors all over, but you see the eyes slow down instantly. We wanted to stir them up to watch out, to pay attention. The writer of Hebrews is doing the very same thing in our text, stirring us up and wanting us in turn to stir each other up, to watch out, to be aware, to be careful, to pay special attention. I got nervous when Dave started to introduce the text. I thought he was going to steal what I was going to say, but no, he... it's good. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for reading the text. Um, great things in this text. Let's start. Five things we want to talk about. Five observations I want to make about this exhortation to counsel one another. We're talking about counseling one another, and there are five things in this text that it talks about counseling one another. You see it comes out essentially in two different places. He talks about stimulating one another and then the, in verse 24, and then at the end he talks about encouraging one another, and that's our counseling word. The first thing I want us to notice is the rationale for this exhortation to counsel one another. What are the reasons? Why is the writer of Hebrews making this an issue? At this point in time, we're not going to get a chance. Dave talked a little bit about the background. Helpful, and we want to touch on the background a little bit. The book of Hebrews is written to Jews who have become Christians. At this time in the church's life, it is very costly for Jews to become Christians because the Jews that are still in the Jewish camp have merged with the government or have agreed with the government to find a scapegoat. And the scapegoat is believers. Christians. Most of them were Jewish Christians that had come out of the Jewish faith. And they persecuted them unendingly. The pressure was on them to think, maybe we don't need to keep doing the Christian things. Maybe we can go back and just do our Jewish stuff and we'll be okay. We can keep our salvation. We can keep our faith and yet be fully Jews. What we know is that's not completely true. That's not really true at all. And the whole book of Hebrews is written to that group of people to say Christ is better, Christ is better. And he says it here sort of in this, one of these closing challenges. Hold on! Stick with it! And so the rationale for this exhortation to counsel one another is because those around you are in danger Might I say it this way, the first reason of these three reasons why is a positive reason, the other two are negatives. The first is because of who we are. Because of who we are. We are the church. You see that in verse 25. He talks about the assembling together. We are the church. We talked in one of our sessions earlier that the church is a local gathering comprised of believers committed to Christ in the care of one another. We are the church. We are meant to be focused on Christ and caring for each other because that's our job description. We talked a number of times, we need to help the church be the church, and that's what he's starting with. This is what the church does. This is who the church is. We are the people of the church, the family of faith, the body of Christ. We need to be the caring, connecting, confronting, counseling siblings to each other in Christ. Now in this, in this text, he's talking both about pastoral care, the leaders to the flock, but even more so because we see the phrase, they mention one another, comes out in the New Testament. We see that twice. The one another is the mutuality of care, one to the other. It's the people you're sitting next to, the people you will have lunch with, the people that you get with at work. And that It's not so much the 
leaders to the others. It's each other to each other. And I would say this is the aim and focus of our lives and our ministry as Christians. This is the aim of the one another ministry of the church in sustaining and strengthening the faith of each other in Christ. Be the church to your brothers and sisters. Encourage them. The foundation of providing faith-sustaining care is the biblical truth that God has put in place this human means, the church, to care. This human means of care to both be given and received. I appreciate the song that talks about be a servant to one another, be willing to be served. That mutuality is bidirectional. It goes both ways. We're going to talk more about what that means but there is a point of this one another means giving and receiving. The church is the human instrument of God's care. The challenge of this is be the church. The goal is that no one feels alone out there all by themselves. There should be no one that's lonely in the church. Everyone is part of the team. Everyone has a necessary part in the team. We have a great support network in the church. Be the church. Counsel one another. Be available to that. That's the first rationale. The second is our temptation to drift. Two negatives. He talks about the temptation when he talks about, you know, when we understand the background of the book, the Jewish Christians were tempted to defect. To say, I'm not going to church anymore. It costs me too much. I'm going back to temple. For them, they were tempted to disassociate with the church. It was too costly to stay there. They're going to go back to the old ways that were familiar and comfortable. In order to avoid persecution, verse 33 talks about, but then it talks about to avoid connection with those who were being persecuted. They may have said, I don't want to associate with any of those people because of the cost it is to me. Out of fear that reprisals would come to them, they were considering stepping away from their church assembly, their church togetherness. There was that temptation to drift, to gradually start moving further and further away. It was costly to be there. It was painful. I don't know if you're facing persecution for your faith, but I do know in almost every culture, regardless of this side of the ocean or the other side, there is a temptation to drift. It's easy to get distracted from our faith, our service, our responsibility for our brothers and sisters. Life gets really busy. Things pile up. Our schedule gets full. Reality sets in with the struggles. And life gets tough. And so it's our temptation to drift away from what's really important and to say, I don't have enough time. And so we gradually cut back. The second temptation is to relax. Relax. It's to get lazy, maybe a little bit. To loosen our hold, loosen our grip on what's really important. It's not just that we get busy, but we lose energy. Verse 23 gives us that, that command that tells us to hold fast our hope, the confession of our hope, without wavering. Wavering is that idea of being shaky. Leaning away from, you know, potentially stepping away. It does go with the idea of drifting. John Owen talks about the toughness of the situation the Hebrews were facing. He says in three ways it shows this. Number one, the word waver indicates that there was great difficulty that led to their temptation to loosen their grip. Apparently, some of the Hebrews were in danger of relaxing their hold on their hope of what really mattered, which is Christ and Christ alone. Because the writer of Hebrews says, without wavering, he was saying, I see some wavering. I see some people questioning. They're starting to maybe be a little bit more backing off. Very difficult situation that's causing even the most faithful believers to start to move away. He says the second thing is this word fast. It doesn't just say hold, it says hold fast. 
The word fast shows utmost strength is required in the defense of hope. There's an energy, there's an effort that is necessary to keep hold of one's hope. It isn't just to hold, you have to hold fast, you have to work hard. And then the word that he's really driving at is hold, communicates that constant perseverance in view in order to maintain one's hope. It requires holding on to. It's a present tense. It's hanging on to, continuing to do that, holding fast. Because of our temptation to lose hope, to lose focus, especially as he talks about at the end, the day is approaching where things are getting harder. Life is more harsh. Persecution has increased. The temptation is to get distracted, to lose hope, to give up. I'd ask you right away, are you under pressure to conform to those around you? Is there a pressure maybe to do things differently? People would say, you know what, what is this thing about going to church every Sunday? Why do you do Bible study on Thursdays or Tuesdays? Why are you involved in that small group? Maybe it's family members. Pressure you. That's sort of, you really seem caught up in this church thing. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's just the pressure of our culture. There's so many other things we could be doing, want to be doing with our family. Maybe it's the pressure to take time off, to take it easy. There's some cultures where there's almost that play mentality certain times of the year, certain areas. There's pressure on parents to conform. I don't know what it is here, but I know parents have a lot of pressure to have their kids involved in lots of things. If you want to be the parent of the year, and every parent does, right? They're going to have to ha- have their kids at soccer, at dance, at this you know, educational program, doing this, doing this, and every night of the week is wrapped up with, or they have traveling sports leagues where on a weekend they'll be away and the kids will play multiple games and the parents aren't in church. The kids aren't in church. That pressure to live up to the standards of the society, maybe for you it's the weariness of the fight. The fight for faith, the fight with our sin, the fight with others. Maybe your spiritual zeal has just begun to waver begun to decline? Has your faith become business as usual? Has church become just another thing in the schedule rather than a vibrant relationship with Jesus? Have you begun to take God and His grace for granted? Or is it fresh, exciting, challenging? Maybe we've become lazy. We desire comfort over the hard work of what it takes to be in relationship with other believers. That counseling one another we've talked about is difficult. And so the first challenge is to say, we need this exhortation because of our temptation to not be the church. Second thing we want to notice is the focus of the exhortation or the mindset of the exhortation. The word is consider. Consider says, consider one another, how to stimulate one another. Typically, I drive when we go on trips. We'll go three hours away or something like that in the middle of a hot summer day. August, we're just coming through that. I climb in the car. I flip the air conditioner all the way up on the blower, maximum air conditioning. And I'm sitting there enjoying the cool air as we're driving down the highway, driving down the road. And every so often I'll catch out of my eye, I'll look over and she's got her coat on. Got zipped up. The dead of summer. And I realize, you know what? I didn't stop to even consider what temperature she was. She is always colder than I am, and I should have been more sensitive. I didn't consider. That's this word. Consider. Pay attention. Look out for. It's a mindset. It's the idea of taking seriously, plan strategize, be intentional, 
Pink says it's thoroughly weighing a matter, calling for the utmost attention. John Piper says it's thinking about pondering, deliberating, meditating, mulling over. What he's talking about here is being alert for opportunities, being sensitive to needs. When we come together, are we looking at each other and saying, I wonder how they're doing spiritually? It means to look at one another, think about one another, focus on one another, study one another, let your mind be occupied with one another. And the goal of this focus on others is to think of ways to stimulate them to love and good deeds, John Piper says. So the challenge of our text is to turn your attention to the matter of encouraging conspicuously, intentionally, with mental discipline those that are around you. Pastor Rich, our pastor at Bethany, said this passage calls us away from a passive approach to relationships in the church to active intentionality in those relationships. Active intentionality. Consider. Let me ask you this. Do you know what is affecting your fellow church members? Do you know what's hitting them the hardest? Men, as pastors, spiritual leaders, elders, do you know what is hitting your flock the hardest? Do you know where your flock is the most vulnerable? Do you know where the weakest? Do you know where their spiritual health is in the greatest danger of breakdown? Are you aware of the areas of greatest vulnerability among those that you rub shoulders with? Before you can counsel one another, you have to know what to counsel them about. Before you can speak into their life, you need to know what help do they need. You don't go to the doctor and expect him just to say, good to see you. Hey, why don't you get a bottle of this stuff and that will help you. You expect him to wait and ask questions, right? So tell me why you're here. Tell me what's up. Tell me what are your pains. And as counselors, we need to listen. We need to pursue. We need to consider. So I'd ask you husbands, do you know what your wife is struggling with this morning, this week? Do you know what her greatest spiritual concern is, greatest spiritual fear is for herself? Maybe for your marriage? Maybe for your kids? Do you know what her greatest discouragement is in the faith? Have you considered that? Parents, have you looked at your kids and said, I wonder what is their greatest struggle? greatest spiritual struggle. They go off to school every day, they come back, and sometimes they talk, sometimes they don't. Do you know where they're wrestling with their faith? Maybe it's in your friendships. Do you know where your best friend is most vulnerable? To either let go of the faith or to fall into sin? Small group leaders, we have a number of different kinds of small groups here, whether it's men's groups, ladies' groups. Do you know where your group is at? Do you know where some of the members are? Do you take the time to consider and to evaluate and to say, I wonder how they're doing? Do you take the time to build that relationship, to ask the question, so how's your week? How's your faith? How's your time in the Word? How's your relationship with Christ? How can I pray for you? Consider says, be aware of the vulnerabilities. Be sensitized to the concerns. Third thing, the text would call us to observe. It talks about the action of the exhortation to counsel one another. Use a couple of phrases in that, but this one just jumps right out in this text. It starts with this statement that says, stir up. Stir up. Other translations, New American Standard uses the word to stimulate. The authorized version used the word to provoke. The word is used of that of spurring horses on, whether it's with the the whip, or whether it's with the spur on the back of the heel to kick it in the withers to get it to move, to get it started. Fascinatingly enough, the word is used always of irritation, exasperation in a negative, in a negative context except here. 
This is the only time it's used positively. Normally, it's like we use the word, provoke them to anger, right? You see that in Ephesians 4. Don't provoke them to anger. Excuse me, Ephesians 6. Don't provoke them to something bad. Don't incite them to something bad. This is the only time it's used in a good sense. It's unusual, and that's the part of it is the benefit of that. It makes it all the more striking. The writer of Hebrews is trying to say, I really want you to get into their life and really propel them. The word means to spur, to prod, to incite, to get a reaction going. Typically, we don't want reactions, right? That angry reaction. But he's talking about a reaction that's godly. To strengthen their zeal, to inflame their infections, to excite them to godly living, to inspire them, to light a fire under them. The writer of Hebrews gives you a bold challenge. This is not some passive light. What do you think about? It's like, man, step into it. This is really important. It's sort of like the coach on the sidelines. Howling to the team. Encouraging them on. Stick with it. Finish strong. You can do it. Be the fourth quarter team. Finish it out. How do we do this? The text gives us a number of statements. There are five of them. It talks about by drawing near in confident faith. How are you going to stir them up? Make sure your faith is secure. Make sure you're an example of somebody who has your faith down pat. You know that your security is in Christ. Number two, by holding unwavering onto hope. Make sure your hope is strong. Are you a hopeful person? Do you have enough hope in Christ and what Christ is going to do to be able to pass some off? Do you overflow in hope? If you're going to counsel one another, you need to be a person of great hope that they can change, that they can get God's help, that they can see their way through this. Number three, by refusing to forsake the church attendance. And number four, by committing to assembling together. Make sure you're connected. Make sure you're not one of those people that's forsaking the assembling. Make sure you're not one of those people, and we're going to talk about that word, that has stepped away from the importance of church gathering. If you're going to counsel one another, you need to be there with them. You need to model that for them, that the church is the place of care. And fifth, by challenging each other toward Christ, make sure you are encouraging, exhorting, challenging them in their faith and their hope. Be a counselor by encouraging. The Hebrews were weary of the fight. They'd grown short-sighted. Maybe it's worth setting aside and not thinking long about Christ. They were fearful. The writer of Hebrews says, you need to be there for them. You need to be the coach on the sidelines shouting out to them, stirring them up. Stick with it. Christ is better. The writer of Hebrews is modeling that because he's talking over and over about everything that Christ is doing is better. What he's talking about is providing external motivation by words, by encouragement, but also internal motivation by helping them change their values to see that Christ is better. Now I would say it this way, the ministering of counseling one another is both of those. It's telling people what they need to hear, what they need to do, helping them in that aspect, but it's also helping them want to do it. Motivating them, encouraging them by our words, by our example, by our caring love, by our gentle, sensitive approach to them. I'd ask you this morning, what are you doing? to incite or to attract believers to a deeper faith? What are you doing to provoke, to stir up others? What are you doing to be that prod, that goad, that encouragement to stick with it? Maybe it's a couple you're working with and one of them is really struggling with their spouse. And you have to agree with them and say, wow, you really have it tough. Your spouse is a real jerk. Typically, we don't say that, all right? We don't need to help them. But we do at times say, that's really tough. That'd be very difficult. And your job as their friend, counselor, is to say, stick with it. God can work. Turn them to some passages that will encourage them. God has changed other spouses in similar situations. Stay with it. And even if God doesn't change, God is better. 
God will reward you with sweet relationship. He will fill the voids that you don't feel like you're getting in your marriage. Stay with it. A young person being pushed to impurity by all the pressures of the society around them. My nephew, his first day in his new high school, got on the bus and the first, one of the first questions all the kids asked him was, are you a virgin? You know what the next response was? That'll change. Because he said, yes, I'm a virgin. The pressure on our young people is intense. The foundation is kicked out from under them. What in the world are you thinking? Why would you even want to stay a virgin? You need to stir them up. Hold on to it. Hold on to your faith. Christ is better. Not purity for purity's sake, purity for God's sake, for worship's sake. There are lots of other things we could talk about. Stir up those. As you sit next to one another, consider what their needs are and how can you stir them up. Number four, the direction of our exhortation to counsel is one another. It's one another. It's that back and forth. The New Testament is filled with one another commands alerting us that life together is vital. We don't do life alone. The church is not about me alone. It is our natural bent, our natural drift to go to selfishness. And so it's critical, and that's probably why it's said so many times in the New Testament, God has appointed us to look out for each other. There are a few others in our life that God wants us to persevere in love and good works in helping them to carry on with that, to speak into their life that way. Don't stop short taking care of your own faith, your own righteousness. Look to others. Arthur Pink said, let us diligently bear in mind and continually have in view the good of our fellow pilgrims. One of the songs used the word pilgrim. Neat. Pilgrims on the way. We're on a path. Taking a conscientious care and circumspection over the spiritual estate and welfare of other Christians. Consider their circumstances, their trials, their temptation, their infirmities, their needs, their conflicts, their discouragement, their falls. Consider what they're going through and be one another to them. That one another is talking that, about that mutuality. It's not a superior to an inferior. It's a peer-to-peer. It's life on life. This care relationship goes both ways. The one another means you need to be giving and you need to be receiving. Tying it together with the stir one another, we might say, stir up, you give out. And be willing to be stirred up with the one another. Be willing to give counsel. Be willing to receive counsel. What is being talked about here in a word? It's probably the word accountability. And accountability goes both ways. Paul Tripp says, your sanctification is a community project. It's a church project. It's a one another project. It's not just about you growing. It's about you participating and helping others grow and letting others help you grow. So we would say in answer to the question in the garden, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. You are your brother's keeper. And we would also say your brother is your keeper. Are you willing to invite them into relationship with you to look into your life, to challenge you on your spiritual health, to help you out? Is there that one another relationship that you'll let people get in close to be transparent, to be vulnerable, and let them help you grow? Do you get that way in your friendships? Do you know where they're weak and you care for them that way? We need to have that one another that says, I've got your back. So this morning, how can you be a blessing to those around you? How can you help them become the best that Christ wants for them? Maybe I'd drill down a little bit more. Who are the one and others in your life? So if you were to stop just a moment, and maybe you can, we'll just take a pause. As you look at this point in your notes, who are the people that God has put around you as the one and others? Who has God called you to care for? Maybe it's that person next to you. 
Maybe it's somebody else you're thinking about. And then, who are the ones you're accountable to? Not just caring for, but you're accountable to. Maybe it's your church leaders. Maybe it's your small group leader. Young people, maybe it's your parents. I might say it this way. Each of us should have a Paul that we look up to. Each of, each of us should have a Timothy that we care for, that we look out for. Number five, the target of the exhortation to counsel one another. There are seven things we want to talk about that describe this target in different ways. Number one, part of the target is we ought to counsel them to a right attitude to love. Matthew 22, 37 to 40 says, Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What a great statement on love. A very passionate, a very full orb statement. It's talking about the heart for love. It's talking about that right motivation. It's not just doing the duty, but there is a strong heart desire wrapped up in this. Love is the opposite of unselfishness, of selfishness, excuse me. It's not looking out for self. The right heart motivation is a motivation of worship. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It involves our affections. What we really value strongly, what we're caught up in, involves our passions, involves our commitments. Christian love needs to be worked at. It isn't automatic. It requires thought, effort. We must be intentional in our relationship in God's family. Pastor Rich said that. We must be intentional in loving one another. And so the first target is to love. A number of commentators pointed out what's fascinating about the word love Hope and faith you can have personally, love you can't have personally only. It's in community. You can't practice this love alone, it requires others to perform it. It's a community activity. We need to love all the more. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4 later, we'll come back to this. But it talks about the fact that Paul says, excel still more. Number two target is counsel them in right actions. The good works. The good works are those fruits of godly love. Good works of service, that spiritual care. And it really refers to the two commands that are coming later. The commands not to forsake, but assemble. And the command to encourage one another. So the third target is that target to counsel them to avoid wrong values. That value of developing a forsaking habit. When he's talking about forsaking, he's talking about a careless abandoning the irregular attendance due to wrong values. And he uses the word the manner, or the habit, or the custom. It's become so common a part of you that it just happens like second nature. It happens without thinking. It's our default response that we are very casual about our commitment to church. It's the custom. It's not a mi- occasional being gone. It's, you know, you can be gone every so often. But it's almost that deliberate, fixed, final departure from the value of church and church family. They're in the state of viewing the church and their Christian fellowship is unimportant. I would say this takes two dimensions. The first is that external dimension, and does show up in the fact of the lack of attendance. They just don't come. They're just not part of it. But I would say there are a number of folks that are at church every Sunday and still violate this command. I can tell you about people that are at our church. People that will walk in the door last minute, singing's done or maybe starting, They race in, find their seat, sit down, the sermon's done, boom, they're out of the church. You'll have to trip them to make contact. And I would say they're forsaking the assembling. 
The goal is not that they connect with anybody. The goal is not that they grow in relationship with anybody. The goal is not that church is even ministering. I'm not sure, I will say this, please don't take this wrong, but I'm not sure why they're even there. I'm glad they're there. I'm glad they're under truth. I'm glad they're hearing truth, but I don't sense that it's changing anything in their life. I don't sense that they really are assembling with other believers and letting it be an encouragement, letting it be a stir up. And so it's not about your bodily presence, it's about your mental presence, it's about your relationships. It's about plugging into others. William Hendrickson says it's just a demonstration of selfishness. We're more concerned about our stuff, our schedule, our needs, our comfort, instead of others. Number five target. Counsel them to develop, instead of wrong values, right values. What's the right value? Assemble. Come together. There's only two options here. Either don't get together or get together. Develop a good habit, a good manner, a good custom of regularly being in connection with other believers. In the early church, that was it almost didn't have to be said. They loved it. They looked forward to getting together. They needed each other. In the Hebrew situation, it was so costly that they were in danger of drawing back. For you, it may be cost in a different way. John MacArthur says, one of the best ways to hold fast to the things of God is to be in fellowship with His people. People who have similar values, similar passions, similar commitments can be an encouragement to stay with it. That's the way we build our friendships anyway, right? You don't find somebody that likes something completely different. You like the orchestra, they like soccer. You, know, you don't find those friendships just growing up together. Typically, it's because you like the same things together. And we come together in the church and have similar values that encourages us in that. Together, we bear the responsibility we're the body of Christ to care for one another and each other's spiritual health. Some of you are familiar with the old TV program, The Lone Ranger? Anybody? Is that here? Out there alone, being the, gun, being the gunslinger. Called him the Lone Ranger. He just took on everything by himself. God never intended believers to be Lone Ranger Christians. He intended them to be on a team. Christians need each other to strengthen the wonderful bond of love they share in Christ. Close and regular fellowship with other believers is not just a nice idea but an absolute necessity for the encouragement of Christian values. It's the way that we'll survive. I don't follow a lot of sports. My dad likes sports, and so we talk about things. I remember when Lance Armstrong was big, dad was reading some articles on the Tour de France, bicyclist. And dad was talking about some of the fascinating things of it. I didn't understand. I said, dad, why does... Armstrong have, there's a number of people on his team. There are other guys that are part of his very same team that are riding bicycles right with him and sometimes they're ahead of him like he's supposed to be the star. It looks to me like if he's not careful, they're going to beat him. And he's supposed to be the one that wins. What are they doing? And there are a number of them. There are, I don't know, three, four, five. And Dad had me read an article or explain to me this whole issue of drafting there were other guys that got on their bicycles because they were helping Lance preserve his energy. And so they went first. And they were cutting through the air in just a limited amount of friction of air or wind or whatever it is. They were the ones that were in the front. And they would essentially divide, you know, like we have in cars, you have the scoops and various things. They were the ones that were taking, they were taking some of the friction away from Lance. He rode right behind him to where they were in the V of the pattern of the draft. To where he had the energy and they would switch. And it was just this constant movement. These guys around Lance just riding forward and they were taking the weight of the friction of the air. What a great picture for the body of Christ, right? There are times where we need to be the point man. We need to take the pain. We need to take the difficult times in order to make it easy on a brother. And it's that idea of assembling together is that opportunity. Can you be the one to take enemy fire to protect your brothers and sisters? 
Can you protect them from the frictions of the world or maybe encourage them in the frictions? We are one. We're part of a team. I beg you, don't be the weakest link. I remember a situation, young couple. They weren't part of my church. Grandma was part of my church. And she influenced her daughter and her daughter started coming to the church and then her granddaughter started coming to the church. Sweet thing. Got to know her. Had a good face. She was heading off to college. And she met a young man at college who was from our area as well. They started coming to our church and they started getting interested in each other. And they asked me to do their wedding. And so we started premarital counseling and talking with them and encouraged them to be in attendance and work on things here at the church. Just helping them grow in their marriage. They headed back to campus at various times. We'd come back and we'd finish the premarital counseling. They got married. Sweet time. The sad part was it was somewhere between three and six months later they were back in my office. And they used a word that I never want to hear a couple say, but they used the word divorce. It's just not working out. I'd encouraged them to get plugged into a church. I said, find a church on campus. Where, where do you know? What about some of the campus fellowships? There are a number of campus organizations that bring Christ into their relationships. Who have you developed friendships with? And they hadn't. And they told me the story. He was getting with his friends and says, man, she's really hard to live with, isn't she? And she was getting with her girlfriends. And she was saying, tell them to get off your back. I said, you've got to get away from those counselors. They're harming you. You've got to get into a church. I'm sad to tell you, it was 12 months later, not 12 months later, it was 12 months from their wedding, I'm almost exact, where they were back and they were talking divorce and they were moving toward it. And I'd begged them to get into church and I'd sent them a pastor's name and said, this guy has a campus church and is there and called him and had him pursue them and they never got plugged in. Until 12 months after their wedding, their relationship was dissolved. They had been listening to the Psalm 1 counsel of the ungodly and it destroyed them. Now, it wasn't all the counselor's fault. We know that. They wanted that counsel, but it messed them up. As a church, there was nobody around them to help draft for them, to help protect them from the onslaught of the world that new marriages have. We know that. Marriage is hard, especially for young couples. They needed the church to be the church for them. In the world that, a world that runs contrary to everything you think and do, we need each other. We need the one another's. And I would challenge you to be there. To be in church. Be dependable. Be counted on. Be consistent. Be committed. Be so involved, can I say it this way? That you're missed when you're not here. That it's obvious if you're not here. Somebody's going to know you're not here because you're so involved. There are people that are looking to see you. Become an active part of the team. Take responsibility for its life and vibrancy. Make it a habit. This assembling together, this connecting with others, gives you a right to do these next thing, to speak into each other's lives. That's the fifth thing. Fifth target is that right practice, which is the real focus, the spear point, is to encourage one another. Right practice is to encourage or exhort one another. That's our counseling word. It means to give counsel and instruction, and it means to be open to receive counsel and instruction in the one another relationship. Members of the church have a communal task of encouraging one another, William Hendricks says. The word is talking about to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to stimulate each other. It takes the form of comfort, it takes the form of warning, it takes the form of challenge. Earlier, the writer of Hebrews said it this way with a very stern Concern, he says, encourage one another daily so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Do you realize, let me just say it this way, today there are people that have struggled with sin this week that may be considering leaving the faith. They may have practiced sin long enough that they feel like such a failure. I'll never get this. I'll never get past it. I give up. I would say those are the people you need to be studying and considering. 
They're weak. And sin confuses, deceives, deludes, and we need to be aware of that and have conversations to help them to plug into biblical view of sin. Together we bear the responsibility for each other's spiritual encouragement. We're talking about Christian peer pressure. How do we encourage one another? The text tells us by provoking them to love and good works and to assembling together. So I'd ask you this morning, is your participation in church an encouragement to those around you? Are you a comforting influence? Is your counseling one another a strengthening influence? Are you an encouraging influence? Do people say, wow, that's the person I want to seek out. They're going to help me. When, when I fail, they're going to be there to support me and encourage me and point me in a new direction and help me along. They're going to pray with me, strengthen me in that. Are you a wise influence? Do you bring the word to bear? And I'd ask you, are you open to being influenced? Are you open to being encouraged? Are you open to being exhorted, to being challenged? Are you open to others offering correction in your life? Are you willing to take the one another? Sixth target, counsel them with the right amount. The right amount. And the right amount is more. So much the more, the writer of Hebrews says, do this all the more, increase as time goes on. Be growing and changing on a continual basis. We're talking about progressive sanctification. I mentioned 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul talks to the Thessalonians and says to them, you know how to love. You have received from God. You're doing it. It's practice. People around you know it, but he says what? You're doing a great job, but excel still more. And there's so much the more is that excel still more. Can I ask you, would others say, or would you say of yourself first, you're an encouraging influence to those around you and it's increased? Are you an encouraging influence that is increasing? Would others say, wow, there's new stuff he's bringing, spiritual stuff he's encouraging me. Let me ask you, would your spouse say that? Would your children say that in your home? That you are growing and being an encourager. You're growing and being a challenge to them in their spiritual faith. Finally, target number seven is to counsel them with the right intensity. Then intensity grows out of this phrase as you see the day drawing near. Look up. There's danger on the horizon and it's right there in front of you. Counseling one another is extremely important in this environment. Take it seriously. John Piper said it this way, being in each other's lives with encouragement is going to be especially needed in the last days. Form the habit now, lest you be taken off guard. David Mathis, the Desiring God, wrote an article and he says, life is now as serious and urgent as it can get. Eternity is now at stake and the writer of Hebrews wants us to be uncompromising in our diligence about the life together as Christians. Don't hold anything back. You will never need the church more than you need it today. And your brothers and sisters that are right there with you will never need the church more than they need it today. As the day draws near, look up. Don't get distracted by all the other things. Don't get lazy. Don't get caught up in that. Pour into stirring one another, provoking one another to growth in Christ. Counsel one another. Let me wrap up with four applications. Number one, one of the things that we have delighted in, I mentioned first, is this church's care for us and our son. And I will tell you, this church wants to care for you. Some of you are from other churches. I understand that's great. If you're not, I would encourage you to know that this church wants to be involved in your life. They want to care for you well. Your spiritual health is their major concern. Your eternal destiny, they are concerned for your soul. And in light of that, they're concerned about where you're going to go after you die. And if you don't know that, that would be the first question we would want to ask you. I would love to talk to you about that. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know where you're going after you die, we want to love you enough to deal with that spiritual issue. 
and to talk clearly about that. You can talk to any of the pastors, any of the elders. They would love to talk to you about that aspect of your spiritual health, becoming a part of the family of faith, the family of God. I would additionally say in that, that not only does this church want to be a part of your life in helping you enter relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior, to deal with the sin problem, to have the cross wash you from those sins, to become a part of the family, but also this church wants to love and care for you. If you don't have a church home, this would be a great place to become a member of. To say, wow, I need to really get plugged in knowing these people care. That's why they have this conference. That's what's such a delight. Is they care enough that they're going to have a whole weekend geared toward how do we care for one another? How do we counsel one another? How do we get into each other's life? This is a great place for you to consider getting plugged into. Additionally, I'd say the text calls us to consider just want to review with you the challenges of this text. There's many. Consider, are you paying attention to other spiritual needs? Are you sensitive to that? Are you energized? Are you provoking others? Are you stirring others up? Are you provoked and stirred up in your faith? Are you excited about what Christ has done? Are you assembling together? Do you have that value that being together with other believers is really, really important? And then are you taking advantage of that connection together to minister to each other to counsel one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another. As we think about, and we talked yesterday about the counseling environment, what are you doing to help this church be a counseling one another environment? What are you doing to contribute to that environment? And what are you doing to develop those kind of relationships? And finally, I just ask you what we asked before, who's doing that in your life? Who are the people that are counseling you, that are loving you, that are caring for you, that are speaking truth to you? And I'd ask you, who do you already have in your life that you need to be doing that with? Maybe you just need to capture those relationships. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's children. Children in your home, adult children. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a workmate. Maybe it's somebody at church. Maybe somebody in your small group. Who has God placed around you that's in need of that Spiritual care. And who has God placed in your life that's speaking into you that way and you need to listen to? The writer of Hebrews is shouting from the sidelines, stick with it. Finish strong. The end is near. We're at the fourth quarter. Two minutes to go. Hold fast. Encourage each other to hold on. Stay with it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this flock in Hebrews that became an example for us. Help us to take the challenge, to counsel one another, to put together everything we've heard over the weekend and to say, I need to do that. I need to think of particular people that you've put around me. Help us to be faithful to that. Encourage us in that. Help this flock, help this church to grow. May this be a foundation that would be an honor to you for generations. May your name be glorified as a result of this time together. In Christ's name, amen.